First and foremost, I'm going to give all praise and honor to the Most High Ahaya, Bahasham Yeshaya, for allowing us to enter into another Sabbath, giving us another seven days to reflect on ourselves, reflect on our lives, and uh, try our best to, as the day go by, become more and more like His only begotten Son. So, with that, let's begin. It looks like we have our first question. Someone says, what does Shabbat Shalom translate to? Well, the word Shabbat is the Hebrew word for Sabbath. And then Shalom, also people may pronounce it as Shalom, simply means peace or greeting. Okay? So Shabbat Shalom simply means Sabbath greeting or greeting on the Sabbath or peace on the Sabbath. Okay. Uh, someone says, why do people go to the Aramaic over the Hebrew definition and teachings? Is it one and the same? And as a, that's a very good question. Um, I believe one reason why people resort to Aramaic um, is they state that Aramaic is the, uh, the oldest surviving language as they like to put it right is that the case the answer is no but they resort to Aramaic that by stating that well or for the purpose they state that it's the oldest surviving uh, language okay <clears throat> when it comes to specifically biblical biblical studies okay now the second question is is Hebrew and Aramaic one and the same? And the answer is no. Though there are similarities, though the Hebrew script, the modern Hebrew script, which is accepted today, was adopted from the Aramaic writing system, okay, showing some similarities between both the Hebrew and the Aramaic, the answer is no. There's, there's, two diff there's differences between ancient Hebrew and Aramaic. Okay? The most obvious difference is, number one, Aramaic goes back to the uh, son of Shem, whose name was Aram. In fact, let me pull that up real quick. In the Bible, the book of Genesis, the 10th chapter, Alright, so it tells us in the book of Genesis 10 and 22, uh, the children of Shem, Elam, and Ashur, and Arphaxad, and Lod, and Aram, or uh, uh, Aram. Okay, so it's from Aram that we derive what we call Aramaic, okay, or Syriac, because Aram is the forefather of the Syrian people, okay. Now, Hebrew, on the other hand, even though we know it goes back, according to Hebrew record, uh, the Hebrew language goes back to creation, or is considered the language of creation. In fact, I'll read that in the book of Jubilees. Okay. Book of Jubilees, chapter 10. And let me see here. Get straight to the point.
In fact, I believe it's 12. Let me try 12. Yes, uh, ju uh, Jubilees chapter uh, 12. Okay, just to make this particular point. Um, it says here in the book of Jubilees chapter 10 or, or chapter 12, verse 24. And I will be a God to thee and to thy son and to thy son's son and to all thy seed. Fear not from henceforth and unto all the generations of the earth. I am thy God. And the Lord God said, open his mouth and his ears, speaking about the mouth the mouth and the ears of Abraham, that he may hear and speak with his mouth, with the language which has been revealed. For it has ceased, ceased from the mouths of all the children of men from the day of the overthrow of Babel. And I opened his mouth and his ears and his lips, and I began to speak with him in the Hebrew tongue, or with him in Hebrew, and the tongue of creation. So I go to the book of Jubilees to prove the point or to exemplify the point that Hebrew, according to Hebrew record, is the language of creation. Right? But we also know that Hebrew, through time, was transferred down to Adam, all the way down to the other side of the flood, to Shem. Okay, from Noah to Shem and then eventually to Eber. And as we read here in the book of um, the book of Jubilees, eventually to Abraham. So I'm, I, I pull out this reference to show the point that the Hebrew, even though it existed before uh, or during the time of creation, it's the language of creation, just to give it a, a, a documented uh, time from dealing from man's point of view. The language itself, Hebrew, or the name Hebrew, goes back to a man by the name of Eber. Okay? And Eber is also documented in the book of Genesis chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 22. Okay? Or in fact, I'm going to jump down uh, to about verse 24. It says, And our foxod begot Selah, and Selah begot Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Okay. I'm going to go up a few verses to get the other reference pertaining to Eber. In verse number 21, Genesis 10 and 21, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japhet the elder. Even unto him were children born. So even though Hebrew, as I mentioned earlier, goes back to the time of creation, the name itself, Hebrew, derives from Eber. When we look at the word Eber in Hebrew, his name is Ibar. Okay? Ibar. So that word Hebrew goes back to the Hebrew word Ibar. And the Hebrew word for Hebrew, I know I'm saying Hebrew a lot, but just to make it clear, the Hebrew word for Hebrew is Ibaria. Ibaria, which means of Eber. Okay? Of Eber. That's what Hebrew means, right? So going back to the point between Aramaic and Hebrew, number one, we know that Aramaic descends from Aram who was a son of Shem. We know that Hebrew is the language of creation. It was used long before the flood. It was used from the beginning of time. But the name itself, Hebrew, comes from Eber, who came much later in history as a son of Shem. So those are the origins of the two different languages. But, as I mentioned, there are similarities. Even though they're two different languages, there are some similarities between the two. Okay. Uh, what is the ancient religion? This is uh, from uh, Shen Tu. 
What is the ancient religion the evil ones are talking about in these movies? Uh, when you say the ancient religion that the evil ones are talking about in these movies, I know there's many movies who speak about, you know, some form of ancient religion, some form of uh, ancient mysticism or some type of mystic belief system. Um, but you have to you have to point out, well, real in reality, you know, any religious belief, any ancient belief system or ancient religion on the outside of what is provided in scripture as far as what the Most High gave to the righteous from generation to generation beginning with Adam is the religion of Satan whether it comes in the form of Buddhism Hinduism ancient Eastern religions uh, Kabbalism um, any ancient belief system, any ancient mystic religion that's being promoted through movies, through television, in one form or another. If it's outside of what the Most High gave unto his righteous seed, from Adam down to Christ, then it is Satanism. Okay? And a majority of those religious beliefs that they're talking about, these ancient mystic belief systems, really are a remarketing or a repackaging of the promises that Satan provided in the book of Genesis, the third chapter. Okay? Or the deception that Satan provided or, or uh, introduced to Eve and eventually Adam in the book of Genesis, the third chapter. So, going to the book of Genesis 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So we all are familiar with this story. But there's a point that I want to get to from this story, which a lot of these ancient religions that are being promoted through television, through movies, through uh, sitcoms and, and cartoons, so on and so forth, really go back to what Satan um, was able to uh, present to Eve in the garden, as we read it here in the book of Genesis, the third chapter. So it says here in the book of Genesis 3 and verse 5, for God knoweth, this is the serpent speaking unto the woman, the serpent is Satan, as we connect this to the book of Revelations 12 and 9. We don't believe that this was a, a man speaking to, to Eve, just to make that clear. For God doeth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay? So, when we examine a lot of these so-called ancient belief systems or these ancient religions, it's surrounded by uh, or it's, it's, it's filled with these concepts of obtaining knowledge, secret hidden wisdom or secret hidden knowledge. And that knowledge usually leads to someone being exalted as a god. Like for example, when you know you hear these through these, uh, the promotion of these religions, um, the power is within. Okay? And, and all these other things which promote the empowerment of self. Alright? The answer is within. The key is within you. So on and so forth. Really taking and perverting what the Bible says, of course Christ says the kingdom of heaven is within you, but we understand that this, there's an external force we must link into in order to get the understanding of this kingdom of heaven. How to build this kingdom of heaven. There's nothing that we are just focusing some form of energy within ourselves or some some type of, you know, whatever they go into that they, they you know, it's about empower the empowerment of themselves to gain this ancient wisdom, this ancient knowledge, this ancient power. These are the same things that Satan promised to the woman in the beginning. Okay? So it says here in verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye, so it appealed to her senses, like some of these religions, when it goes into you being able to master yourself, 
to master the mind and master the energy and you'll be able to do all these great things through the mastering of self these things are pleasant to the eyes okay it's pleasant to the sight these are the, the, the things that entrap us and, and, and cause us to, to want to partake in, to, in, in some of these ancient belief systems because it's promising us power knowledge wisdom which the rest of the world or the majority of the world does not possess okay so reading on it says uh, in a tree desire to make one wise so that's the selling point the wisdom right she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband and he did eat right so we all know what happened in the story we know that the end result of them partaking in this fruit led to the downfall of mankind and we're still seeing the effects we're still living the effects of the downfall of mankind based on what took place in the book of Genesis the third chapter all right so really that's the origin um, of this 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 ancient religion this ancient mysticism that you know they, they promote um, within the entertainment industry okay Uh, we have one truth, Shabbat Shalom family, and blessed and beautiful, beautiful Sabbath. I'm currently seeking employment. I can, I, I am considered a laborer. I am conflicted on my application. I am putting down the days I prefer to work. I am excluding the Sabbath day because I want to keep the holy day and gather with the body in Atlanta. I'm not getting back calls. What should I do? should I put that I can work on those days okay nine times out of ten when it comes to a lot of these companies um, and as it pursues to getting off on the Sabbath um, really the the option that that tends to work is getting in the company first building a rapport and then eventually being able to get off on the Sabbath that's normally what tends to work okay when you when you come initially stating well these are the days that I seek to, to to work and don't work automatically for them they're gonna overlook you and look for someone who is willing to work on those particular days okay so there's one of two things you can do you can continue to put on your application that you don't desire to work on the Sabbath and hopefully someone will acknowledge that and will give you a job and recognize that you don't work on the Sabbath or you can put down that you're available to work you get in you build a rapport and then eventually you're able to make that uh, that gesture that well going forward I don't want to work on the Sabbath okay also there's a such thing as Sabbath exemption but again that normally tends to work based on you already having some type of uh, relationship with the workplace that allows you to you know eventually get off on the Sabbath okay so I would say put out the same way you put out an application in one place saying you want the Sabbath off put in the application for another place saying that hey you're available on the Sabbath and then see what happens okay Uh, what are the appropriate responses when Gentiles say to us Happy New Year or Happy Easter since we don't recognize those holidays as our own? You can simply say bless you. Okay? Just so continue on with your normal conversation or your, your normal greetings and your, your goodbyes because the reality is that even though it's frustrating, the people of this earth, both those who are Gentiles of natural bloodline, natural stock, as well as those who are Israelites from the, the children of Israel but are Gentiles in, in a Gentile state of mind the reality is that they don't know any better when it comes to the celebration of holidays or certain greetings like in the world it's customary that during the time of the holidays you say happy Easter happy holidays Merry Christmas Happy New Year it's customary 
So really, they think they're just being friendly or they're doing the, the customary acts of wishing someone a happy holiday, so on and so forth. They don't know any better. So you, speaking to this person or dealing with this person, they say, Merry Christmas, you just say, bless you. Okay? Happy Easter. Bless you. Goodbye. All right? You don't have to respond with Merry Christmas, so on and so forth. Or if the opportunity presents itself, you can use it as a, a, a teaching moment. Not to jump down a person's throat and say, stop, stop saying Merry Christmas, you devil, you, gent you Gentile, you, you pagan, so on and so forth. That wouldn't be the way to approach the situation. Again, they don't know better. It's the same thing when we were in the world. When it came to the holidays, it was customary to say Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we didn't know any better. It wasn't until the truth that we realized what we were involving ourselves with by saying those things or recognizing those things. So it's the same thing for those who are still in the world. They don't know any better. So you must deal with them as such. Bless you. Okay, goodbye. You have a good one. Okay? So that's, that's how you deal with, with people in those particular uh, situations. All right? Um, uh, Elder, when discussing the actual length of the year, how do I explain the difference between the KJV and what is in the Book of Jubilees saying the full length of Enoch's life? The Bible says 365 and Jubilee says states uh, 364. Uh, what is correct? Is there somewhere in the Bible where we can associate uh, 364 for the naysayers? And that is a good question. Uh, the Bible, when we go into the record, does say that Enoch lived 364 years. In fact, let's go through the different accounts of Enoch's life, dealing with the Bible, Jubilees, and also Enoch. All right? So, of course, we're going to start in the Bible. All right? The book of Genesis, the fifth chapter. And... <clears throat> And we're going to go to verse number uh, 18. And Jared lived in 162 years and begot Enoch. And Jared lived after he had begot Enoch 800 years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared's life were nine, or all the days of Jared were 900 years. And sixty and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived sixty and five years, and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with the Most High, after he had begot Methuselah three hundred years, and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch's life were three hundred and sixty and five years. So that's the biblical record of Enoch's life. Okay. Now we're going to go to the book of Jubilees and get the record on the life of Enoch. Going back to about uh, Jubilees chapter 4. So going to the book of Enoch, chapter 4, uh, verse 16, it says, And in the eleventh year, Jared took to himself a wife, and her name was Barakah, the daughter of Rasujel, a daughter of his father's brother. In the fourth week of this jubilee, and she bare him a son in the fifth week, and in the fourth year of the jubilee, and she called his name Enoch. And he was the first among men that are born on earth who learnt writing and knowledge and wisdom and wrote down the signs of heaven according to the order of months in a book that men might know the seasons of the year according to their order of their separate months. 
And he was the first to write a testimony, and he testified to the sons of men amongst the generations of the earth, and recounted the weeks of the Jubilees, and made them known, uh, known to them the days of the years, and set in order the months, and recounted the Sabbaths of the years as we made them known to him. And what was said, and what will be, or Salakia, and what was, what was, and what will be, he saw in a vision of his sleep. As it will happen to the children of men throughout their generations until their judgment, he saw and understood everything and wrote his testimony and placed the testimony on earth for all the children of men for their generations. And in the twelfth jubilee, and in the seventh week thereof, he took to himself a wife, and her name was Etna, the daughter of Danel, the daughter of his father's brother. And in the sixth year in this week, she bare him a son, and he called his name Methuselah. And he was moreover with the angels of God six jubilees of years. And they showed him everything which is on earth and in heaven, and the rule of the sun, and he wrote down everything. And he testified to the watchers who had sinned with the daughters of men, for these had begun to unite themselves so as to be defiled with the daughters of men, and Enoch testified against them all. And he was taken from amongst the children of men, and we conducted with him, or conducted him, into the garden of Eden in majesty and honor. And behold, there he writes down the condemnation of the judgment of the world, and of all the wickedness of the children of men. And on account of it, God brought the waters of the flood upon the earth. Okay, so here... And the account of Jubilees, it doesn't mention a specific amount of years as to how long uh, uh, Enoch lived. Okay, it does mention that he was with the angels of God six Jubilees of years. Okay, now I believe in the book of Jasher, it actually goes into... Some, also some in-depth understanding of Enoch's ministry as it relates to his life and his, the, the time of his life, okay? So going here to the book of Jasher. We're going to go to the history of Enoch. And it says here, in the book of Enoch, chapter 6, we're going to start at about, let me see where we can get straight to the point. In fact, we're going to go back to chapter 3, uh, Jasher chapter 3. All right. Uh, the book of Jasher, chapter uh, 3, we're going to start at verse 4. And he said, Rise, go forth from thy house and from the place where thou doest hide thyself, and appear to the sons of men in order that thou mayest teach them the way in which they should go, and the work which they must accomplish to enter into the ways of God. And Enoch rose up according to the word of the Lord, and went forth from his house and from his place, and from the chamber in which he was concealed. And he went to the sons of men and taught them in the ways of the Lord. And at that time assembled the sons of men and acquainted them with the instruction of the Lord. And he ordered it to be proclaimed in all places where the sons of men dwelt, saying, Where is the man who wishes to know the ways of the Lord and good works? Let him come to Enoch. So again, this is recounting the history of Enoch's course, um, Enoch's ministry, while he was on earth, right? So, in verse 7 it says, And all the children of men then assembled to him, for all who desired this thing went to Enoch. And Enoch reigned over the sons of men according to the word of the Lord, and they came and bowed to him, and they heard his word. And the Spirit of God was upon Enoch, and he taught all his men the wisdom of God and his ways. And the sons of men served the Lord all the days of Enoch, and they came to hear his wisdom. And all the kings of the sons of men, both first and last, together with their princes and judges, 
came to Enoch when the, they heard of his wisdom, and they bowed down to him, and they required also of Enoch to reign over them, to which he consented. And they assembled in, in all 130 kings and princes, and they made Enoch king over them, and they were all under his power and command. So Enoch was just not a prophet or a man of God who operated on the earth. He did operate in power and rulership as a king. In fact, the book of Jubilees tells us that from Adam unto, I believe, uh, Isaac, or un from Adam unto Jacob, if I'm not mistaken, there were 22 heads of mankind. Okay, from Adam unto Jacob. So they also operated with some level, level of power and authority in the earth, and we see that example with Enoch. Okay, so it says here in verse 12, or verse 11, and Enoch taught them wisdom, knowledge, and the ways of the Lord, and he made peace amongst men. And peace was throughout the earth during, during the life of Enoch. And Enoch reigned over the sons of men 243 years, and he did justice and righteousness with all his people. And he led them in the ways of the Lord. And these are the generations of Enoch. So now it's going through the children of Enoch, but now I'm going to move over to when Enoch is now being translated. Uh, verse 17 states, And it was in the year of Adam's death, which was the 243rd year of the reign of Enoch, and that time Enoch resolved to separate himself from the sons of men, and to secret himself as at first in order to serve the Lord. And Enoch did so, but did not entirely secret himself from them, but kept away from the sons of men three days, and then went to them for one day. And during the three, day, three days that he was in the chamber, he prayed to, and he praised the Lord his God, and the day on which he went, and appeared to the subjects, and he taught them the ways of the Lord. And they all asked him about the Lord, he, or they all asked him about the Lord, he told them. Verse 20 states, And he did this manner for many years, and he afterward concealed himself for six days and appeared to his people one day at seven, and after that once in a month, and then once in a year, until all the kings, princes, and sons of men sought for him, and desired again to see the face of Enoch, and to hear his word, but they could not, as all the sons of men were greatly afraid of Enoch, and they feared to approach him on account of the God like all that was seated upon his countenance. Therefore no man could look at him, fearing he might be punished and die. So that was similar to what we saw with uh, e, uh, with Moses. Also in the book of Enoch, it speaks about Noah also having that, that God-like uh, presence, uh, which men were afraid of. And I'm, since we're here, we're dealing with question and answer, just to make mention for those who have read that account in the book of Enoch concerning Noah, a lot of people draw the conclusion that, well, Noah must have been albino. When that particular account is not speaking about um, necessarily his, his skin complexion or skin tone or being albino. It's speaking about the same thing we're reading here with Enoch, with that, that, that God-like, with, with the, the book of Jasher, Salakia, says was a God-like aura or a God-like shine that, that, that shined about or shone about him, as well as what we read in the book of Exodus, the 32nd chapter with Moses how he had that uh, God-like shine that shone about his face to the point where he had to put a veil on his face, okay? So it says here in the book of Enoch, chapter 3, verse 21, And all the kings and the princes resolved to assemble the sons of men and came to Enoch, thinking that they might all speak to him at the time when he, when he should come forth amongst them, and they did so. And the day came when Enoch went forth, and they all assembled and came to him, and Enoch spoke to them the words of the Lord, and he taught them wisdom and knowledge. And they bowed down before him, and they said, May the king live, may the king live. And in some time after, when the kings and princes and the sons of men were speaking to Enoch, and Enoch was teaching the ways of God, behold, an angel of the Lord then called unto Enoch from heaven, and wished to bring him up to heaven to make him reign over the sons of God, as he had reigned over the sons of men upon earth. When at that time Enoch heard this, he went and assembled all the inhabitants of the earth, 
and taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instruction. And he said to them, I have been required to ascend into heaven. I therefore do not know of the day of my going. Verse 25 says, And now therefore I will teach you wisdom and knowledge, and I will give you instruction before I leave you, how to act upon earth whereby ye may live. And he did so. And he taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them instruction and reproved them, and he placed before them statutes and judgments to do upon earth. And he made peace among them, and he taught them everlasting life, and dwelt with them, uh, and dwelt with them some time teaching all these kings. And at that time the sons of men were with Enoch, and Enoch was speaking to them, and they lifted up their eyes, and there was a likeness of a great horse descended from heaven, and a horse paced the air. So getting to the point of when he was taken up, this is going into his uh, translation. All right, so getting down straight to the point. All right, so here in the book of Jasher, jumping over to chapter 4, verse 1, it says, In all the days that Enoch lived upon earth were 365 years. And when Enoch had ascended into heaven, all the kings of the earth rose and took Methuselah, his son, and anointed him, and they caused him to reign over them in the place of his father. And Methuselah acted uprightly in the uh, sight of the Most High. So now this is going into the, the reign of Methuselah, who was the son of Enoch. All right. So the book of Jasher agrees with the biblical account that Enoch lived for 365 years. Okay. Now, going to the book of Enoch and the account, I believe it mentions... In the book of Enoch, if I'm not mistaken, that the the time. In fact, let's go to the, the book of Enoch and the account that it gives concerning the book or the, the the time of Enoch's life. Okay, because what people do, and let me ask the sister who asked the question, uh, or the person who asked the question. I'm not sure if it's a, a brother or sister. Uh, Tra Muante. Tramuante. Let me ask, what is the purpose that the person is asking the question uh, dealing with the time period of Enoch's life as it's recorded in the Bible, uh, opposed to how it's recorded in other records? Is it because they're stating that the other records are not true books and that they contradict the biblical uh, time period that it gives for Enoch's life? What is the purpose in particular as to why they, they asked the question? All right, I'm going to wait for the response from Truamonte. Uh, Tramonte to uh, answer the question. All right, I'm going to come back. Uh, I'm seeing more questions uh, coming in. Um, I'm going to come back to some of these questions all right but I'm waiting for the response from Trump Muante to see what is the purpose that people are asking that particular question are they saying that because it they're seeing some form of they're looking at it as some form of contradiction between the Bible and uh, and uh, Jubilees and uh, the uh, book of Enoch for what purpose are they asking the question
All right, again, there's quite a few questions coming through, but I'm, I'm trying to wait on Tramuante to respond. Um, if not, if there's no response, I'll have to. Okay, someone says they probably wanted to explain the 364-day year. Okay, but I want to hear from Tramuante the purpose, the reason why uh, people are asking that particular question. That could also be possibly a case, the case. Right, okay, trauma want say I'm a sister because I asked because in Jubilees it states that a measure of a year is to be measured uh Enoch's life, 364, but when I read these accounts, there are differences, um, the years, so I wanted to know how to battle any differences, and yes, that is a very good question. So we're going to go to the record of Enoch, and we're going to read that account, all right, so hopefully resolve the calculation of time or the calculation of a year, okay, based on Enoch's life and ministry all right let me pull up the book of Enoch here All right, let me see if we can find it here. The account of Enoch, okay? And then we're gonna go back to the Book of Jasher as well as the Book of Jubilees to resolve that question of Enoch's life, okay? As it pertains to its connection with the calculation of a year, okay? All right, I'm going to put the chat. Okay, the chat is on pause at the moment. All right, so let's go back to the book of Jubilees and read the account of the calculation of the year as it relates to the life of Enoch. All right. So going back to the book of Jubilees, see if we can pull it up here. All right, there we go. So we're going to read the account again in the book of Jubilees. We're going to get straight to the point. 
uh, Jubilees chapter 4, verse 21. And he was moreover, speaking about Enoch, with the angel, angels of God, three and six jubilees of years. And they showed him everything which is on earth and in heaven and the rule of the sun, and he wrote down everything. And he testified to the watchers who had sent with the daughters of men, for these had begun to unite themselves so as to be defiled with the daughters of men. And Enoch testified against them all. And he was taken from amongst the children of men, and we conducted him into the garden of Eden in majesty and honor. And behold, there he writes down the condemnation of the judgment of the world and of all the wickedness of the children of men. And on account of it, the Most High brought the waters of the flood upon the earth. For there he was, he set a sign that he should testify against the children of men, that he should recount all the deeds of the generations of the condemnation. So, we're dealing with, we're dealing with two different things here when it comes to um, Enoch as it pertains to the 364 and the 365. Okay? Now, let's go back to the book of Jasher to read that history again. Then we're going to go back into the uh, back into the Bible. Okay? And we're going to go into some of the information that we skipped over in the book of Jasher also to help resolve this uh, this question. So going back to the book of Jasher, chapter 3, and verse 12. So it says, And Enoch reigned over the sons of men 243 years. So for 243 years, Enoch reigned over the sons of men. And he did justice and ju righteousness with all his people. And he led them in the ways of the Lord. And these are the generations of Enoch, Methuselah, Elisha, Alimelech, three sons, and their sisters, sisters Melchah, and Nama, and Methuselah. They lived 807 years. And Methuselah lived 800 or 87 years, Salachia, and he begot Lamech. It was in the 56th year of the life of Lamech when Adam died. 930 years old was he at the time of his death, and his two sons, and Enoch and Methuselah his son, buried him with great pomp, as at the burial of kings in the cave which God had told him. And in that place all the sons of men made a great mourning and a weeping on account of Adam. It has therefore become a custom among men, the sons of men, to do this day. And Adam died because he had ate of the tree of knowledge, he and his children after him, and the Lord, as the Lord God had spoken. It was in the year of Adam's death, which was about 243rd year of the reign of Enoch, and that Enoch himself resolved to separate himself from the sons of men, and to secret himself as at the first in order to serve the Lord. And Enoch did so, but did not entirely secret himself from them, but kept away from the sons of men three hundred days, and he went to them for one day. During the three years that he was in the chamber, he prayed and praised the Lord his God, and the day on which he appeared to his subjects, he taught them the ways of the Lord, and all they asked him about the Lord, he told them. And he did in this manner for many years, and afterward concealed himself for six days, and appeared to his people one day in seven. And after that, once in a month and once in a year, unto all the king's princes and the sons of men sought for him, and desired again to see the face of Enoch, and to hear his word, but they could not. And all the sons of men were greatly afraid of Enoch, and they feared to approach him on account of the godlike awe that was seated upon his countenance. Therefore no man could look at him, fearing he might be punished and die. And all the kings of princes resolved to assemble the sons of men and to come to Enoch, thinking that they might all speak to him at the time when he should come forth against, against, amongst them. And they did so. And they came when Enoch went, and the day came when Enoch went forth and assembled 
and came to him. And Enoch spoke to them words of the Lord, and he taught them wisdom and knowledge. And they bowed before him, and they said, May the king live, may the king live. So jumping over here, we read where the chariot took him up into heaven. So we're going to jump down to about verse number 31. And all the sons of men assembled and came to Enoch that day. And all the kings of the earth with their princes and counselors remained with them that day. And Enoch taught the sons of men wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instruction. And he bade them to serve the Lord and walk in all his ways all the days of their life. And it was after that that he rose and rode upon the horse and went forth and all the sons of men went after him about 800,000 men. And they went with him one day's journey. And the second day uh, said to him, Return home to your tents. Why will ye go? Perhaps ye may die. And some of them went from him, and those that remained with him six days' journey. And Enoch said to them every day, Return to your tents, lest ye may die. But they were not willing to return, and they went with him. And on the sixth day some of the men remained and clung to him, and they said to him, we will go to thee, we will go to thee to the place where thou goest, as the Lord liveth, death only shall separate us. And they shall urge so much to go with him, uh, that he ceased speaking to them, and they went after him and would not return. And when the kings returned, they caused a census to be taken in order to know the number of remaining men that went with Enoch. And it was upon the seventh day that Enoch ascended into heaven in a whirlwind with horses and chariots of fire. And on the eighth day, all the kings that had been with Enoch sent to bring back the number of men that were with Enoch in the place from which he ascended into heaven. And all those kings that went to the place, they found the earth were filled with snow, and upon the snow were large sto stones of snow. And one said to, enough, to the other, Come, let us break through the snow, perhaps um, and, and see, perhaps, the men that remained with Enoch are dead and are now under the stones of snow. And they searched but could not find him, for he had ascended into heaven. In all the days of Enoch, that Enoch lived upon the earth were 365 years. Okay? So, again, in the um, book of Jash, as we showed earlier, it states that Enoch lived 365 years. Now, let's go into the book of Jubilees again, but this time we're going to go to the actual account of the calculation of time, as it mentions uh, in accordance with the events that surrounded the life of Noah, okay? And I'm going to go here for a reason. Let's go to the book of Enoch, or the book of Jubilees, chapter... Six. In fact, we're going to start before chapter six. And we're going to show, according to Jubilees, how the 364 day was calculated or what events inspired that calculation of the 364. Okay. So we're going to go to the book of uh, Jubilees, and we're going to start in verse number, let's see, or chapter number, twenty-one. We're going to start in chapter uh, five, verse number twenty-one. All right. Just one moment. All 
All right, so this is the book of Jubilees, chapter 9, verse, or Slocket, chapter 5, verse 21. And he commanded Noah to make an ark that he might save himself from the waters of the flood. And Noah made the ark in all respects as he had commanded him. In the 27th year of uh, Jubilee of years, one moment. It says, in the 27th Jubilee of years, in the fifth week, in the fifth year, on the new moon of the first month. And he entered in the sixth thereof. All right, one moment. One moment here. All right, so going back to the book of Jubilees, chapter 5, I'm going to, get, I'm going to try to get as straight to the point of po as possible so we don't, we don't have to read the uh, whole account. But nonetheless, there's some important events that took place in this account of Jubilees. And of course, we know that the um, that 364-day calculation came before the time of Noah. We know that the 364-day count was recorded and documented by Enoch. As we read earlier in the Book of Jubilees, it states that the Most High showed to him and made known to him. And in fact, I'm going to go back to that uh, account and read that where it tells us that the Most High made known to him the knowledge of time. Okay, So going back to the Book of Jubilees, chapter um, 4, and let's see here, uh, verse 16 or verse 18. And he was first to write a testimony and he testified, in fact, verse 17. Uh, and he was first, the first among men that are born on earth who learnt writing and the knowledge of wisdom and who wrote down the signs of heaven according to their order of their months in a book that men might know the seasons of the years according to the order of their separate months. Okay? So what Enoch did was he wrote down the order of the signs of heaven, the order of the, the constellations, the order of the sun as the Most High had established it. Verse 18 says, And he was the first to write a testimony, and he testified to the sons of men, amongst the generations of the earth, as we read in, in Jasher, so Jasher confirms what we read in Jubilees, and recounted the weeks of Jubilees, and made them to know the days of the years, and set in order the months, and recounted the Sabbaths of years, as we have made them known to him. So Enoch received the knowledge of the calculation of time, as it was revealed to him by the angels, right? And what was said, and what will be saw in a vision of his sleep, as it will pertain to the sons of men throughout their generations until the day of judgment. And he saw and understood everything, and wrote his testimony, and placed the testimony in the earth for all the children of men for their generations. So, I'm going back here to show that Enoch wrote concerning the counting of days, the calculation of time, the time of the, the calculation of the sun, the calculation of the moon based on what was revealed to him from the angels of heaven. That can be read in full detail in the book of Enoch. Okay, so now we're going to the book of Jubilees again, showing further information as to how that time that was shown to Enoch, that 364-day cycle, was confirmed through the events that took place during the time of 
Noah, or reaffirmed, I should say, during the events that took place during the time of Noah. Okay? So it says here, I want to get straight to the point. I don't want to read this too much because we have quite a few questions to uh, answer concerning, uh, or a lot of questions to answer in the chat. But nonetheless, let me see where we can start, where we can get straight to the point. So I'm going to start in verse number 19. In fact, verse 21. This is Jubilees 5 and 21. In fact, let me make, make sure we're still in chapter. Let me make that 6 and 21. Jubilees 6 and 21. For it is the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of First Fruits. This feast is twofold and of a double nature according to what is written and engraven concerning it celebrated. For I have written in the book of the law in which I have written for thee that thou shouldest celebrate it in its season one day in the year and i explained to thee its sacrifices that the children of israel should remember and should celebrate it throughout their generations in this month one day in every year and on the new moon of the first month and on the new moon of the fourth month and on the new moon of the seventh month and on the new moon of the tenth month which we know these are speaking about new months in the uh, fourth month uh, the new month or the new month of the first month the fourth month the seventh month and the tenth month are the days of remembrance and the days of the seasons and four divisions of the year these are written and ordained as a testimony for ever so what we're reading here in the book of Jubilees is written in heaven for a testimony forever it is the same information that was revealed and shown to Enoch as it is stated in the book of Jubilees, the fourth chapter, and is explained in detail in the book of Enoch, the full book of Enoch, particularly the uh, calculation of the, the heavenly luminaries, uh, the sun, the moon, so on and so forth. Okay, so Enoch only wrote and documented the calculation of time as it was shown to him from the angels of heaven. Okay, and that same time is being explained through the events of Noah's life. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever, so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him. And on the new moon of the first month, or the new month of the first month, he was bidden to make for himself an ark. And on that day the earth became dry, and he opened the ark and saw the earth. And on the new month of the fourth month, the mouths of the depths of the abysses beneath were closed. And on the new month of the seventh month, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were opened. And the waters began to descend into them. And on the new month of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains were seen, and Noah was glad. And on this account he ordained them for himself as feast, for a memorial forever, and thus they are ordained. And they placed them on heavenly tables, each had thirteen weeks, from one to another past their memorial. From the first to the second, and from the second to the third, and from the third to the fourth. And all the days of the commandment will be... Two and fifty weeks of days, and these will make the entire year complete. So it's giving the calculation of time, and it's showing how the events of Noah's life actually fell in place during these particular time periods, based on the time period which, again, was already established before Noah. But it just so happened that the events that took place during Noah's life, the building of the ark, when the mouths of the abysses were opened, when the Most High sent the flood waters of the, upon the earth, they fell directly on the days of remembrance, which are the first, the days of remembrance are the first moon or the first month, uh, or the, the, the first day bringing in the new moon for the first month, the first day bringing in the season for the four, uh, fourth month, that first day bringing in the change of season for the seventh month, and that day that brings in the change of season in the 10th month. Those are the days of remembrance. And on those days, different events took place surrounding the events of Noah's life and the deluge or the flood. Okay. So it says here in verse number 30, 
And all the days of the commandment will be 52 weeks, as was established both in Enoch as well as here in Jubilees. And these will make the entire year complete. Thus it is engraven and ordained on the heavenly tables, and there is no neglecting the commandment for a single year for, or from year to year. And thou shalt and, and command thou the children of Israel that they observe the years according to the reckoning, 364 days. And these will constitute a complete year, and they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feast. For everything will fall out in them according to their testimony, and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast. So again, it's going into the uh, calculation of the 364 days. But the reason why I went here was to show in the Book of Jubilees that even it tells us that what was shown to Enoch according to time was based on what was already established in the heavens. The calculation of the sun, the luminaries, the moon, the constellations, how long it takes them to cycle around the earth, which was already established as 364. So that was revealed to Enoch, and then eventually it was also exemplified through the life of Noah, mainly the, the aspect of his life that pertains to the flood and the events of the flood. Okay? So that's, that's really the, the origin or the basis of how time is calculated. Now, for, for the sake of for the sake of edification here, For the sake of edification here, uh, uh, Tremonte, because maybe I'm missing something here, okay? Is, is there a particular verse that we can, we can point to which shows that the, the calculation of time was based solely upon the, um, the life of Enoch? And if there is, we'll, we'll go to that verse and we'll examine it and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll take it from there. So is Tremonte, is there a verse which goes into the, you know, the the time period uh, being based on Enoch's life? Okay. And I'm going to wait for Tramonte to respond. All right. And all of these questions, we're going to make sure we answer them all. So don't worry, brothers and sisters. I know I mentioned initially an hour and a half, but I'll stay on as long as I need to to get through a lot of these questions that have, that have come through. Okay. I'm waiting for Tramuante's uh, response. The sister Tramuante, excuse me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Again, I'm waiting. I see a lot of your questions here. And again, I'm going to take the time to answer all of them. Okay. And I'm going to try to answer them in a timely fashion, of course. But nonetheless, I'm going to try to at least touch on all of your questions before we close out. But I just want to um, make sure I, I fully, you know, um, answer Tramuante's question.
some very good questions are coming through. I, I mean, I can't wait. That's why I want I want the sister to, to, to put the information in the chat because I want to get to uh, I, I want to get to a lot of these good questions. All right. So what I'll what I'll do is I'll I'll keep the, the chat open for now, so that you know Trauma Wante can can put the um, the response within the um, I'll, I'll 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 leave it open so that Trauma Wante can put the um, the response um, in the chat when whenever she's ready but what i'll do is i'll go back and i'll answer some more of these uh these questions that are here for the sake of time all right and then i'll come back when i see your response i'll, I'll come directly back to your your, your question uh trauma wante Um, is there a concordance that is applicable to the Apocrypha uh, since, go back here, is there a concordance uh, applicable to the Apocrypha since the Strong's doesn't include the Apocrypha? Uh, the answer is yes, but the concordance for the Apocrypha is more so just an index uh, listing of different uh, references in the Bible or different words and where they can be found. Um, in the Bible, it doesn't contain like a like the Strong's contains the Hebrew and Greek reference numbers uh, references for those words that are listed in the Bible. So, for example, uh, in the Strong's Concordance for the Old and New Testament, it will say, for instance, it'll give you the word Earth and an index listing of everywhere where the word Earth can be found translated in the Bible. Then, with that word Earth. They now go. They now link it to a reference number for the Old Testament, the Hebrew for the New Testament, the Greek, to now show you how that word "earth" or what word is used in the Hebrew to translate that word "earth," okay, or where that word "earth" in English is translated from based on Hebrew. All right. Now the difference between that and what you find in the Apocrypha Concordance is it just simply. For, for instance, it'll just simply show you everywhere where Earth is listed in the Apocrypha, but it won't give you a, um, a list of the Greek word where Earth that was used to translate the word Earth. Okay? Well, let me pull it up. The Apocrypha Concordance. We actually have a few copies of this here. All right, it's called Cruden's Complete Concordance to the Apocrypha. All right, Cruden's Complete Concordance to the Apocrypha. All right, so I said I put the link for the apocryphal concordance at, at the uh, in the chat. Okay. Moving on to the next one, we have daughter of Ahia Shalawam Elder, and Daniel. 8 and 20 through 21 it speaks about the kings of media uh, Persia and Grecia 
Can you please tell me who these nations are today and what nations rose up out of Grisha? Thank you. That is a very good question. Let's go to the book of Daniel, chapter 8, verses uh, 21 through 20. I'll start in verse 20, where it says here, uh, The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. When it says kings, it's making mention of the actual kingdoms of Media and Persia. Okay? So, the ram, as we know, uh, represents, the ram with two horns, uh, represents the kingdoms of Media and Persia. Okay? Two separate nations combined for one to create one kingdom, a united kingdom, all right? So it says here, and the rough goat is the king of Grisha, meaning the kingdom of Grisha, and the great, the, the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now, in that instance, is actually making mention of the first king, the first man king of Greece, which was Alexander. Okay, so again, the rough goat is the kingdom of Grisha. It says king, but it's referencing the kingdom of Grisha. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, who was the first king of the Greek Empire or the Grecian Empire, Alexander the Greek, or as history knows him, uh, recognizes him, Alexander the Great. Okay. So it goes on to say, now that being broken, whereas it stood four up, up, up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of that nation. We know that when Alexander uh, died, rulership was given to his four generals, and those four generals ruled over four different areas uh, which Alexander had conquered during the time of his life. Those areas are Macedonia, um, Asia Minor, um, Egypt under the Ptolemies, or the Ptolemies, and then you have really Mesopotamia along with other Middle Eastern regions uh, like Israel and, and other places which was under the Seleucids, okay? So the question is, who are these nations today and do they exist? Who are the nations who came out of them? Well, first and foremost, we know that Alexander was an Edomite. The Grecians who came under or who ruled under Alexander, the Seleucids, uh, the Ptolemies, uh, Cassander, uh, Lysimachus, okay, these were also Idumeans, okay. There's also reference of Antig Antigonus, which was another a prominent figure uh, under Alexander. These were all Edomites. How do we know this? Well, when we go into history, we find a character by the name of Haman the Agagite, who is written in the book of uh, Esther. When we go to the book of Esther, the third chapter, we read of Haman the Agagite. Esther chapter 3 verse 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman the son of Hamedatha the Agagite and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. So Haman the Agagite was a descendant of Amalek. Who was Amalek? Amalek is a grandson of Esau. He's documented and written in the book of Genesis, the 36th chapter. Okay, Amalek, who I believe was the son of Eliphaz, the son of Esau. Okay, so when it says the Agagite, that's in reference to Agag, who was once a king of Amalek. That line of Agagite was the king's lineage of the Amalekites. Okay, again, the Amalekites are descendants of Amalek who was the grandson of Esau. 
right? So now the question is, what does this have to do with Alexander the Great or Alexander the Greek? Well, we're going to find out that this same Haman, who in the Bible is referred to as an Agagite, which is an Edomite of the seed of Amalek, the Apocrypha refers to the same Haman as a Macedonian. So we're going to go to the rest of Esther in the Apocrypha. The rest of Esther, chapter 16. And we're going to read some extended history of Haman, the Agagite, or the Amalekite, right? So this is the book of Esther, the rest of Esther and the Apocrypha. This is a continuation of the book of Esther. We know that the biblical account of Esther ends in chapter 10, verse 3, and the rest of Esther picks up chapter 10, verse 4. Okay, so we're going to go to chapter 16. And we're going to start at verse 10. Now, it's recounting the history of Haman that we read of in Esther chapter uh, 3, verse 1. And it tells us in Esther 3 and 1 that Haman was an Agagite. In fact, I'm going to pull up that term, a Gagite, in the book of Esther 3. The word is a Gagia, which means I will overtop. And that word a Gagia simply means from or of Agag, or a descendant of Agag. Okay, now who is Agag? We know when we go back to the book of uh, First. Samuel, I believe, 15, when Saul was meant to go and kill uh, and wipe out the seed of the Amalekites, the name of the king of the Amalekites was Agag. Okay, so Agag was of the king's lineage of Amalek. So it says here, when we break down Amalek, it says Agag of uncertain devoration, flame, Agog. A title of Amalekitish kings. Amalekitish meaning pertaining to the Amalekites. So that's a title for Amalekite kings. The kings of Amalek. Who is Amalek again? If we go to the book of Genesis 36. And let's see here. Verse number. Getting straight to the point. Genesis 36, verse 12, it tells us, And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. So Eliphaz was the son of Esau. And she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. So Amalek is the grandson of Esau. Right? So again, what does this have to do with Alexander the Great? Or Alexander the Greek? When we go to the book of Esther, chapter 16 and 10 in the Apocrypha, it tells us that that same Haman, who was identified as an Amalekite in the Bible, was actually of the seed of the Macedonians. So, in the book of Esther, chapter 16, verse 10, it tells us for Haman, a Macedonian, the son of Hamedathah, that's the same Haman in the book of Esther, and it refers to him as a Macedonian, which is important because we're going to show that Alexander descended from Macedon, Okay, being indeed a stranger from the Persian blood. So he gained, even though he gained a high status under the king of Persia, a Persia who was at that time Ahasuerus, he was not of Persian blood. He was an Amalekite, an Edomite. Okay, and as a stranger received of us, had so forth obtained the favor that he showed toward every nation, and that as he was called our father and was continually honored of all men as the next person unto the king. 
But he, not bearing his great dignity, went about to deprive us of our kingdom and life, having by manifold and cunning deceits sought of us the destruction of uh, the destruction as well as of Mordecai, who saved our life, and continually procured our good as also of blameless Esther, partaker of our kingdom with the whole nation. Verse 14 states, For by these means he thought, finding us destitute of friends, to have translated the kingdom of the Persians to the Macedonians. So the whole time Haman was working underhandedly in an attempt to remove all power from the Persian Empire, which was ruling at that time, to try to move it over to the power of the Macedonians. Now we know eventually the Most High would bring forth that transition from the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire, over into the Greek Empire. But Haman was trying to cause that transition before it was time. Okay? So, Haman was not only a Macedonian, he was trying to usurp power from the Persians to transition the rulership and the kingdom and authority from the Persians unto the Macedonians. Later in history, we see that Alexander descends from the same place of Macedonia, which Haman was working to gain power for, to gain rulership for, to usurp the kingdom of Persia for. Okay? So it says here in the book of 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 1, and it happened that after Alexander, the son of Philip, the Macedonian. Okay? So these Macedonians, who were now exercising power in the land of Macedon, which originally was a land of the children of Japheth, but eventually was moved over or eventually dominated by the children of Edom. Okay? So it says, the Macedonians, so now Edomites were now being recognized as Macedonians during the time of Alexander, who came out of the land of Kittim, has smitten Darius, king of the Persians and Medes, that he reigned in his stead the first over Greece. So Alexander fulfilled that prophecy in the book of Daniel 8 as being the first king of this new Greek empire. Now we know that there were many rulers over Greece before Alexander. But Alexander became the first Idumean king to not only rule over the Greek empire, but to now take dominance over the whole earth, or pretty much uh, gain supremacy over the whole earth, all right? So the nations which um, descended from this particular empire are Idumeans. Now, of course, in these areas today, you have what are called, <clears throat> you have your Eastern European nations, which are currently residing in these lands today, which are also Edom. But to some degree, they're kind of um, they kind of looked down upon, so to speak, uh, amongst the, the 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 prominent nations of Ed, uh, Edom, like the British and the you know those great nations, the French and those nations which are recognized, the Germans as being the great nations of Edom, the uh, Eastern Europeans, like the the modern day Macedonians and uh, the, the Serbians and uh, the Romanians and those particular nations, they reside in those areas from where Alexander gained his power from or rose from. Okay? So those, those are where those nations reside today. You can go here to a map of Macedon. We know that Macedon is close to areas such as Greece. Let me go back. Let me get it here. Let me get a proper map here.
All right, so we know it's Macedon is like northeast of Greece, and then you have those those other uh, areas which surround that landmass of Macedon. Let me try to find a proper map here. All right, they keep giving me these, these very poor, poor maps. But nonetheless, those areas where he originally sprung from are the areas which are surrounded by areas such as like Romania and some of the other what they call Eastern European nations uh, today, which, are, you know, really they, they kind of considered the, you know, You see here, they consider it like the, you know, the, the lowly of, of Edom, but, but nonetheless, that's where the power of uh, Alexander sprung from. And then going into the Persian na nations, just to be brief, moving on to some of these other questions. Uh, the Persian nations, the Med well, the Medes initially, um, the Medes actually descend from Japhet. Okay, they are Japhetic nations. All right, and then you have the Persians, which also, which, uh, descent from Shem. Okay, so it's a mixed nation of Japhites. That nation was a mixed nation of Japhites and um, and Shemites, with the Medes coming from Japhet and the Persians coming from uh, Shem. All right. All right, moving on to some of the other questions here. Someone says, I was watching a few films over the past few weeks, and they have all mentioned the ancient religion, although evil, they were divided, wanting the religion to return, and the others wanted it, wanting to keep it abolished. Okay. Well, again, all of, all of those ancient so-called religions outside the Bible are those, you know, those demonic religions which... Again, the, the selling point is knowledge, wisdom, power, you know, so on and so forth. But they're all satanic religions. And in these movies, what they'll try to do is they'll try to create a good side of the ancient demonic religion and then an evil side of the ancient demonic religion. Like, for example, Star Wars. Uh, here it is. They're both using a demonic power. But then you have one side, the Jedi which are supposedly using this demonic power for good, and then the other side, which is supposedly using this demonic power for, for uh, evil. But the power itself is demonic. There's no such thing as a good and evil side of it. Okay? So they'll try to use that, they'll try to do that in movies, and it causes confusion, uh, and it'll actually have you cheering for the quote-unquote good guys, when in reality, the good guys are just as demonic as the portrayed bad guys. They're both using the same forces, the same demonic spirits, the same lies, the same power. They just paint one in a, a better light than the other one. Okay? But getting back to the original point, all of those ancient religions outside of the biblical knowledge and understanding are demonic. Okay? To the highest degree. Uh, someone says it was stated that Christ was born during Sukkot according to the things people were preparation during the time. Has GOCC came across revelation teaching or allegations? Sukkot means uh, manger. Okay. Uh, well, we're, we're, we are going to put that information out there in the, the very near future. And the word Sukkot, if I'm not mistaken, that means tabernacle. Okay, Sakawak.
In fact, let me look that up. That could be very, could be very revelatory. That could be very revelatory. Let's see here. All right. So it says here that the the word that it comes from, uh, from the Hebrew. I'm looking in the Greek here. Um, the word they have here is fatna, fatne, or fatna, for uh, manger. And it says manger or stall, a crib or a manger. A crib for fodder, manger or stall. Okay, so it seems like it's more so in reference to a, a, a horse stall. Okay, and the Septuagint word, the, meaning the Hebrew word that this uh, correlates to is abawas. Okay, Abawas, or as it would be pronounced in modern Hebrew, Evus. Let's see if I can find that word here. So yes, the word that it's it's, it's translated from in the Hebrew is Abawas, which is which is crib. Uh, Sukkot means tabernacle. Right, let me pull it up here. So this is from Exodus 29, 25, and, and 9. All right. Now the word for tabernacle they use here is Mishkan or Mashakan. So let's see if we can find that word Sukkot. All right. See if we can find that word here. I believe we'll find that in Leviticus. Let's try Leviticus 23. Where it says booths. All right, so yes, that that word, uh, that that modern Hebrew word Sukkot, goes back to the Hebrew word Sukkot, which means booths. Okay, Sukkot, or in other instances, it's spelled as Sakawat. Okay, but we will be going into that um, that breakdown in the very near future concerning um, the, the the context clues, which show um, where. Uh, or when Christ was actually born. Uh, someone says, if you lead, this is humble servant 77, Shalom, if you lead by example as the husband and our Gentile and a comforter to your wife, how do you let your wife know you want the same treatment? Just wait and hope. Okay. That may be something that's a little bit more, you know, that, that takes a little bit more counsel than you'll get within it, you know, with, within a QA and a segment. Because it, normally when it comes to situations between husband and wife and, you know, um, I'm assuming it's a situation of a believer, non-believer, or even with believers. I mean, there's many elements at play. Um, there's always two sides to a story in, in, in some of these situations. So... To better, this question probably would be better suited for a more detailed, probably email, uh, call, or, or something of that nature. So what you can do is I'm going to give you an email address where you can send your question to, and I'll, I'll get to your question as soon as possible. Okay? But just to give a generalized viewpoint of husband and wife, a generalized viewpoint... The Bible does give understanding of, you know, reciprocation within a relationship between husband and wife, right? So that you can find that in the book of 1 Corinthians 7. 
All right. Of course, we know the Bible speaks about, I believe in Peter, which says, uh, uh, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. So, and it starts off letting the wives know to, um, uh, the wives to honor their husbands as, as Sarah honored Abraham, calling him Lord. And then it comes back and says that the husbands must love their wives as Christ loved the church. So that love between husband and wife is supposed to be reciprocal, right? But let's go here to the book of 1 Corinthians 7. And I'm just going to read a quick reference here, which also deals with that, that understanding of having someone who is a non-believer who is pleasing to dwell. If they're pleasing to dwell, it says not to put them away. But if they depart, let them go. You're not in bondage in such cases. But the Most High have called us to peace, meaning that even though if that person decides to depart, you're not bound, that's not what we desire. We don't desire a situation in which there's a, a departure or divorce or separation. Neither do we, um, neither, neither do we uh, uh, feed that spirit which would lead one to, to uh, go down the road of divorce. And I'm not saying that this, this was taking place here. I'm just using some of these references as examples to show what the Bible says about the relationship between husband, husband and wife and how there is, to some degree, the Bible speaks of it being a, a two-way relationship. Okay. Now, again, to get more in-depth details of, of the ins and outs of this, this particular situation, it'll probably take a little bit more uh, time to, 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 to deal with, okay, as far as a, you know, email with some, some in-depth understanding of, you know, what do you mean by the same treatment or what's, you know, what are the, the, the other elements at play, okay? So I'm going to give you an email address. Remind me before we close out. In fact, I'm going to text it to you here. Let's see if I can send you a A message here one moment just one moment in fact what you can do for for the time being is make sure you send one to GOCC South at yahoo.com just send it there and I'll, I'll deal with it accordingly okay Uh, going here, getting back to where we were initially. All right. Um, um, Elder, can you provide us with some truth about Kwanzaa? Uh, where does it come from? Uh, that is a very good question, and I'm just going to just to give a brief history of where it comes from. I'm going to pull up the actual historical record, the historical documentation of this, uh, this holiday called Kwanzaa. Uh, this was a holiday started in the 60s during the uh, Civil Rights Movement by someone who thought that instead of uh, black people partaking in Christmas uh, or what they considered you know, white people's holidays or any other form of holiday during this time, they would have a holiday which more so represents quote unquote African heritage. Okay. So I'm going to read this here. This is from history.com. Um, the date it gives is December 26, 1966, the first Kwanzaa. It says the first day of, of the, the first day of the first Kwanzaa is celebrated in Los Angeles under the direction of Maul, Maulana Karenga, um, the chair of the Black Studies at California State University at Long Beach. So this uh, Maulana Karenga was the person who began to institute that celebration of Kwanzaa here in the United States, but he took it from uh, different uh, African traditionalist religions and he mixed it with elements of Christmas and Hanukkah and when I say Hanukkah I'm not speaking about how we would celebrate it being the true Hebrews I'm speaking about how the fake Hebrews celebrate Hanukkah or the fake Jews celebrate Hanukkah 
So it says, the chair of the black studies at California State at University of Long Beach. The seven-day holiday, which has strong African roots, was designed by Dr. Karenga as a celebration of African-American family, community, and culture. In 1965, a deadly riot broke out in the predominantly uh, black Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles, leaving 34 people dead, 1,000 injured, and $40 million worth, $40 million worth of property destroyed. Koranga, a former black activist, was deeply disturbed by the devastation and searched for a way to overcome the despair he felt had gripped the African-American community in the riot's aftermath. He founded US, a black cultural organization, and looked to Africa in search of practices and concepts that might empower and unite the nation's African-American community. Now, it sounds all fine and dandy. It sounds all good. And, um, hey, he probably, I, I wasn't there when he created it. I'm, I wasn't in his mind. So, you know, unless I do further research on this individual, I would have to conclude that he probably did it in good earnest. Okay? But nonetheless, when we go back to some of these movements uh, from the 60s, like the Black Panthers and a lot of these different movements, when you when you delve a little deeper and you see some of the connections they had and some of the... Um, their belief systems and um, the overall agendas that they were seeking to push within the black community, you find out that they weren't, you know, when it comes to, a, you know, on the surface level, they were seen as heroes. But when you delve a little deeper, you start to see there were some fishy things about some of these organizations and what they represented and what they were trying to, to, to push within our communities. Okay. But nonetheless, um, it says here, he founded US, a black cultural organization, and looked to Africa in search of practices and concepts that might empower and unite the nation's African-American community. So that's the dangerous aspect uh, that I'm speaking about where, hey, let's say hypothetically he did this in good earnest, but in going back and, and searching, he went back to Africa to find African traditions to now bring those things over here to the Americas. Now, again, it sounds good and fine and dandy. At least it's not the white man's Christmas. At least it's not the Santa Claus, so on and so forth, or the white Jesus, what have you, right? But nonetheless, when you start to go into some of these different traditions that were celebrated in Africa, that tend to be brought over to the States, these things have some dark, demonic elements that are involved in these holidays but when we receive it on our on this side of the americas just like christmas we know it has some dark elements some demonic elements related to it when we receive it we receive the commercialized made for tv version of christmas we don't receive the sacrifices uh the understanding of the sacrifices that are made for christmas or the demonic origins of christmas we get the commercialized made for tv version it is the same thing with some of these other holidays where it's about black culture, so on and so forth. We get the more, you know, palatable, the more palatable uh, uh, versions of these particular uh, belief systems. The things we can accept, uh, strong community, love, black power, and all these, these are the things we receive. We don't get the dark elements that are associated with these celebrations, right? So, going back, it says here, inspired by Africa's harvest celebrations, he decided to develop a non-religious holiday that would stress the importance of family and community while giving African Americans an opportunity to explore their African identities. Karenga combined aspects of several different harvest celebrations, such as those of the Ashanti and those of the Zulu, to form the basis of Kwanzaa. The name Kwanzaa is derived from the phrase Matunda Ya Kwanzaa, which means first fruit in Swahili. Each family celebrates Kwanzaa in its own way, but celebrations often, often include songs and dances, African drums, storytelling, poetry readings, and a large traditional meal. On each of the seven nights, the, fa the family gathers a child and lights one of the candles on the kin kinara or candle holder. Uh, then one of the seven principles is discussed. 
Now again, on the surface, these things sound all good, fine and dandy. Children come together, they learn about you know African roots and they get stories, they get music, they get poetry, you know, they get the family bond. But at the same time, we get the same, you know, it's no different than what we get on Christmas. It's just two different belief systems being taught. We get family on Christmas, we get uh, uh, food on Christmas, we get music on Christmas. So there's really no difference in, in, the, in, the, in that particular aspect. What we're more so focused on is the, 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 the beneath the surface elements that are involved in these religions. Okay? So it says here, the principles of the Unguzo Saba are values of African culture that contribute to building and reinforcing community among African Americans. These values include unity, self-determination, collection or collective work and responsibility, economic co cooperation, purpose, creativity, and faith. And again, those sound good, but here's the question. When you're teaching the values of unity, the question is unifying or building unity under what? We know when we're trying to build, we're trying to build unity under the, 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 the doctrine and the gospel of Christ. Okay? The question is, what are you building unity under? Self-determination. Okay? What does that mean? What is, what, what is the self-determination you're speaking of? Okay? So these things sound good on the surface, but when you go in depth and you're trying to figure out, okay, some more defined, some more definitive understanding as to what they mean with these celebrations and these these different words, you start to find out that there's no different in some of those ancient religions I was referring to earlier. Okay? So it says collective work and responsibility, economic cooperation. Economic cooperation with who? Okay? Purpose, creativity, and faith. Faith in what? All right? An African feast called a Koruma is held on December uh, 31st. Today, Kwanzaa is celebrated by millions of people of African descent all across the United States and Canada. Okay, so that's the origin of Kwanzaa. But, you know, to make a long story short, if it's not contained in the Bible as a holiday, like, for example, um, someone was asking the other day concerning pastors who will look at, you know, the, the information we bring out on Christmas, and they'll say, well, Where's the primary sources to show that Christmas is a pagan demonic holiday? Well, the reality is that we can't get more primary as believers in the Bible than the Bible. So if we're looking for a source of information of what to celebrate, we have to go back to the Bible. The question is, what holidays are listed in the Bible for the purpose of celebration? We have the Passover, we have the weekly Sabbath, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Purim, the Feast of Dedication. These are the holidays that are listed within the Bible. Okay? Now, some one may say, well, how about we celebrate the day that Christ, or we celebrate Sunday because we believe that it's the day that Christ rose. Well, nowhere in the Bible does it say to celebrate a day because Christ rose on that day. Okay? Uh, some may say, well, let's, because Christ was such a great figure and he meant so much when he came into the earth, let's create a day, a holiday to celebrate his birth. Well, it sounds all, you know, fine and dandy on the surface, but nowhere in the Bible does it say to celebrate his birth. Okay? So it's the same thing with, I'm using that as an example when it comes to some of these other holidays. Number one, they're not biblically inspired. And secondly, when it comes for the purpose of why these holidays are celebrated, we can't just look at the surface aspect, which is always going to be positive. It's always going to be good on the surface, okay, and fair seeming. You have to go beneath the surface and look at the root of what's truly being celebrated and represented, okay? Because if we have the holidays in the Bible, and we have knowledge of who we are, of course this brother didn't have that knowledge when he created this holiday, but when we have that knowledge of who we are, there's no need to go out and try to create another holiday, which is geared specifically towards our culture and our history. The Bible is filled with those types of holidays. Okay?
But that's just a brief, a brief understanding of Kwanzaa. Of course, it's not a biblically inspired holiday. We should not celebrate it just as much as we won't celebrate Christmas or we won't be celebrating Hanukkah with the Jewish people. Okay? All right, so I'm going to kind of fast forward and get through some more of these um, these questions. Uh, let me see here. We just did the one on Kwanzaa. Uh, Bankster Spankster, brother, can you speak on the difference between the lying Jews using the black cube or of Cronus and Ishmael's black cube at Mecca, Kaaba, uh, also spelled Kaaba, a small shrine located near the center of the great mosque in Mecca, basically uh, same word as Kabbalah, uh, the, that the Kabbalistic alleged Jews that worship their black cube Tephilims. Well, the reality is that there is no difference. There is no difference between the two. Going back earlier to what I was stating when it comes to a lot of these quote-unquote ancient religions, these the, the pagan uh, Gentile religions of this earth, there's always some form of a connection between all of them. No matter how much they seem divided from the surface, as I was mentioning earlier, no matter how much they seem divided or against one another, there's a connection between all of these pagan religions. And that connection not only goes back to what was promised in the garden in the book of Genesis, the third chapter, but also Genesis, the 11th chapter with the Tower of Babel. When all these nations came together with one mind and one consent, it wasn't just them coming together based on one language. It was one ideology that also allowed them to come together and unite to build a tower to the heavens. Okay? So, just we, because we know the story of the Tower of Babel, I'm not going to necessarily go there and recount it, but um, for those who don't know, the Tower of Babel story is Genesis the 11th chapter, which I'm referring to. Uh, when you look at that story, and we see where the Most High notices that these nations are coming together with one consent to build a tower into heaven, which the book of Jasher elaborates that their, um, their fit or their purpose was to try to fight against the Most High in heaven uh, with this tower. So when they built this tower, the Most High seen their, their, the, the purpose behind the tower, the Most High looked down and he began to send forth 70 different angels to now scatter and divide these nations according to language, okay? So that they can no longer communicate in one consent, in one mind to build this tower. So eventually, these nations, when they were divided in language, began to now go into the different areas that they were allotted by the Most High, meaning the children of Japheth went over into the lands of Japheth, the children of Ham went into the lands of Ham, the children of Shem went into the lands of Shem. Okay? So the languages were changed, but the ideologies stayed the same. They remained the same. So you're going to see similarities in the Buddhist belief systems and their traditions. Even though the Buddha religion comes, I believe, um, somewhere in the 5th or 6th century BC, the ideas of that religion stand back much further than just the 5th or 6th century BC. Same thing with Islam. Even though it comes in the 7th century AD or the 6th or 7th century AD, the ideas of this religion extend further, way further back than the 6th or 7th century AD. Okay? So, my point is that when these different nations were scattered into the lands of, of prompt, their different lands of promise, or what they were promised uh, their, as, as far as allotment, they took with them those same religious ideologies and principles that was learned at the Tower of Babel. And they continued those religious beliefs. They continued with the ideologies and the philosophies. And therefore, because of that, you're seeing similarities between all of these religions, no matter where they may be located in the earth. Whether it's in Egypt, whether it's in Babylon, whether it's um, 
in the Middle East under Islam, whether it's with the Jewish people, okay, they all carry those same uh, falsehoods that were developed at the Tower of Babel, okay, including that 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 so-called cube, uh, Kaaba, uh, or, or the, the the cube of Kronos, or the, the the cube of Saturn, whatever they call it, okay. Uh, we we do not currently have a congregation in the Philistine or in the Philippines. Okay, but we are looking to to get to as many of these areas as possible, including the Philippines. And I believe the the closest congregations we have for the, the the brothers and sisters in those those regions of Asia is the congregations in the South Pacific. Okay, so what you can do is you can send an email to. Uh, GOCC South at yahoo.com and I'll send your I'll forward your information to those who are actually in those areas who can stay in contact with you until you're able to, to be baptized someone says in the book of Esther 9 and 1 the 12th month is called Adar is that correct or interjected by the record thieves the answer is no. It's, it's not an it's not an injection. After the Babylonian captivity, uh, we began to adopt names for the months of the year. Okay, our people did start doing that, and when we wrote down and recorded records, we would use names for the months uh, after the Babylonian captivity. And Adar is one of those months. All right, but we more so tend to deal with the number. The numbers of months as they were before the first month second month third month fourth month so on and so forth but we did begin to adopt those 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 names after the Babylonian captivity all right moving on to the someone says is it lawful to cook light meals on the Sabbath uh, the water and the answer to that question, number one, we are, you know, myself and, and Elder Gabar, we had a, a conversation on this, looking into um, the different um, uh, record or the different um, instances in, in throughout the different records, which, which make mention of what can be done or what cannot be done on the Sabbath. Okay. Now, we know that the uh, original institution on the law against cooking on the Sabbath or not necessarily even cooking on the Sabbath, of working on the Sabbath was based on the actual work that had to go into preparing meals in ancient times. For example, in ancient times, to cook, it wasn't just turning on a knob or pressing a button and all of a sudden you got fire or you have an electric range which is now heating up to allow you just to, to warm something up, or whatever the case may be. In ancient times, they had to go out, they had to get wood for to, to get wood for the fire. They had to start a fire, which is work within itself, kindle that flame, get it going. So listen, we've all done barbecues before. And we know, even though we don't use we don't always necessarily use wood, we know the work it sometimes takes to start a fire for a barbecue. And that's using charcoal. So imagine, and, and, and fire starter and all these other things. So imagine just using wood, uh, using uh, twigs or what, what have you to start a fire. And to keep that fire going, to keep it burning evenly, so on and so forth. All of these things will work. Okay? Not to mention the, the work it took to now prepare the, the mill itself, skinning the animal. Okay, chopping it up in quarters, dividing the animal. Okay, all of these things will work. Okay, nowadays there's something called convenience. You're not skinning an animal to cook. You're not going out to get wood to start a fire. Okay, you're not laboring to get the fire going and, and, and trying to make sure it burned evenly and, and all those things. You're simply going into a refrigerator, you're pulling out, a pack of, of, of chicken or whatever it is you're cooking 
and you're putting it over an already started an already developed flame through technology okay now am I saying that te technology makes it to where you don't have to honor the most High's commandments the answer is no what I'm saying is that the work that was used in order to do things in ancient times in our time is not necessarily a necessity okay there's no there's no labor that goes into uh, outside of just cooking itself that takes place on the Sabbath okay so now getting back to the original point is it okay to cook meals on the Sabbath all right and in this instance because the scriptures don't go into specifically uh, cooking or, or things of that nature on the Sabbath and the, the instance it does uh, make mention of in in the book of Exodus 16 is more so in reference to the gathering of manna and the preparation of manna okay so there's nothing in the Bible which definitively says that it's it's not okay or it's okay to prepare a meal or to cook a meal on the Sabbath okay the instance it does give again in Exodus 16 is dealing with the preparation of manna it says bake what you shall bake sieve what you shall sieve and then um, it says don't go out on the morrow or go out tomorrow gather in twice as much today and then when you read further down the condemnation was more so against them going out and trying to gather more manna on the Sabbath than it was actually trying to cook manna on the Sabbath okay just to make that clear so in those instances until we're able to go deeper in research and see if there's anything definitive which goes into or, or deals with uh, cooking on the Sabbath which what's okay to do on the Sabbath as far as preparing a meal is it okay to you know if you have something prepared from the day before to just put that on on the uh, put that in the oven or whatever the case may be and prepare it that way just looking into all those different things which may have been you know documented in other records to come to a conclusion on that particular um, that particular commandment but what we do say is that your conscience you cannot work against your conscience and I know a lot of brothers and sisters they don't like that they say well you know what's this thing about working against your conscience is there anything definitive well the reality is that even though your conscience, you know, if your conscience is destroyed or if it's, it's, it's you know, is um, defiled, then of course it's not going to be a proper parameter for decision making. Okay? But if you're, you know, operating according to the commandments, right? And you read a commandment or you read something in the Bible which plays out on your conscience as stating, well, maybe based on the scripture I cannot cook on the Sabbath and every time I go to prepare a meal on the Sabbath my conscience works against me in that case do not cook on the Sabbath if you're sitting there at the stove your conscience is working against you it's eating away at you you feel like you're breaking the commandments step away from the stove do not cook on the Sabbath until you're able to find something definitive to say one way or the other do not do it at all okay because once you start working against your conscience and sinning against your conscience then you will start a a, a tradition or a a custom of just doing things even though it's working against your conscience you're used to breaking uh, you, you're used to going against your conscience you're used to working against your conscience so you can do it in one instance you'll start to do it in other instances okay so again, if it's on your conscience not to cook on the Sabbath, do not cook on the Sabbath until you're able to find something definitive to say one way or the other. Okay? So moving on to the next one. Moving on to the next one. Let me see what we have here. Uh, we have uh, Shah Kadar, which says, thank you, elders. A quick question about the Maccabees lesson. If a hypothetical situation arose where someone was being forced to eat swine or their children and family would be killed, is there any place for grace, the grace of Christ, in this type of situation? Thank you. The reality is that we have to stick with what the Bible says, the example the Bible gives us. 
And the example that the Bible gave us was that story in Maccabees, being faced with that situation. And the decision that was made by the family, including the mother, in that particular situation was not to eat swine. Okay? Even if your life, because the reality is that, like I was mentioning earlier about the conscience, if your conscience will allow you to justify something in that instance, such as eating pork uh, and, and using the grace of Christ, maybe the, the grace will cover it, that same mindset, and that's not saying you in particular, but I'm just showing the example of how your conscience works in conjunction with the commandments, right? And decision making. That same exact thought process can have someone say, well, I could either take the mark of the beast or, and, and, uh, and my family live, or the decision is to not take the mark of the beast and my whole family dies. I and my family gets killed. So in order to uh, spare the life of my family, I'll just use grace and take the mark of the beast. And again, I'm not saying that that's your thought process, but that's just how the conscience works. When you do one thing, when you allow one thing in that's against your conscience, you'll start, it, it'll be a, a snowball effect where now you're making so many other decisions based on things that are against the conscience, and then you'll pass it off as it being the grace of Christ. Okay, I'll just be covered by grace in this situation. Okay? So, we have, in that instance, we have to stick with the example that the Bible gives where you're being faced in that situation and it's life or death, you have to be willing to, to accept death. Okay? And just to give an example, going to the book of Revelations 20, Revelations 20, verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yeshia and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So there were many people in past times who were beheaded, who were put to death because they did not worship the beast. They did not worship his image. And in our time, did not receive the mark of the beast when that is instituted. Okay. So in that instance, we would have to we would have to become like martyrs. Okay. Will there be a church in Wisconsin? We are working to to develop a church in Wisconsin. I believe the closest um, congregation we have there currently is Chicago, but we are looking to branch out into. Uh, those surrounding states uh, of Chicago. Elder, can you explain Acts 2.38? Some saying we receive the Holy Spirit willy-nilly. Can you explain, um, cause the verse I quoted after the baptism, but some say after laying on of hands, and also some say if you ask. Okay. Well, let's go to the account in the, the book of Acts, because in that instance, when that gift of the Holy Spirit was manifested, this was before these men were baptized. Okay? These men who were present. Okay, in fact, excuse me, let me let me go to the account too. Okay, before I, I make that statement there. So it says here, we know the story of how the, the, the Holy Spirit came down as uh, cloven tongues, like as a fire. And these men were filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So 
So I'm going to jump down here to where men began to be baptized. And, and anyway, just on the outside of this particular scripture in itself, uh, chapter 2, verse 38, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Yeshua the Anointed, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and unto your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. So there, there are many instances in the Bible, there are examples in Scripture in the book of Acts, where before someone was baptized, um, the Most High would um, impart to them the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then afterwards they would be baptized. I believe that's in, um, I believe that's in Acts, the 10th chapter, just to give that as an example. So it says here in uh, Acts 10 and 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on, on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, or astonished, as many as came to Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the gift of the Holy Spirit as well, and he commanded them to be baptized. So this was the example I was referring to, where the Most High did pour out the Holy Spirit on these men, um, or impart the, 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 the gift of the Holy Spirit upon these men before they were baptized, and then eventually it led to them receiving baptism. So, number one, regardless if the Holy Spirit manifests itself before baptism, or after baptism, the key point is baptism. It's not like these men received the gift of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit was manifested unto them and they just decided to go about their way and just, you know, business as usual. Afterwards, they went to the water to be baptized. Okay? So that's first and foremost. But secondly, there are examples in Scripture where either before baptism, the Holy Spirit was manifested and it led men to be baptized, or after baptism, where someone was placed in the water, after they were baptized, they received the Holy Spirit. We've seen that example with Christ. And then we also see the example of where men were baptized, placed in the water, and then, the, and then afterwards, hands were laid upon them and the gift of the Holy Spirit was imparted in that fashion. Okay? So as Christ told Nicodemus, um, the spirit moveth wherever it listeth, meaning there's no cap or control on how the, the Holy Spirit operates, where it can go, where, where it can't go. It goes wherever the Most High directs it to go. Okay? But there are some key points which come with the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Like we see in the book of Acts 10, men who received it before baptism but then decided to go and get baptized after receiving that gift. Okay? Now, before I read uh, the book of John, the third chapter, I'm going to go to the book of um, Acts, the 19th chapter. Okay? Because we also, again, throughout the Bible, we see the example of the Holy Spirit being imparted through the laying on of hands. Okay? So it says here, in Acts chapter 19, verse uh, 2, or uh, verse 1, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard as whether there be any Holy Spirit. So they didn't hear of the Holy Spirit, these, these particular disciples. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. So they were baptized under John. Okay? And John's baptism wasn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? It was simply the baptism of repentance. 
Verse 4 says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. And that, and that is on Yeshua the anointed, or Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Yeshua. So when they heard this, they went and they got baptized. And I know some people would say, well, no, nah. the baptism was them being taught by Peter, and that was them being baptized. No, that's not the case. These men heard the word of Christ. They heard the testimony given through Paul, and they were taken to the water. And the same way they were baptized by John in the water, after receiving the word of repentance or the uh, the, the uh, teaching of repentance from John, they did the same thing after hearing the teaching of the gospel of Christ. They went to the water and were baptized. Verse 6 says, And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So after they were baptized, hands were laid upon these men, and then the gift of the Holy Spirit was imparted. Okay? And normally that's what we do when it comes to anointing an elder or deacon or position in the church. We anoint them, anoint them, we lay hands upon them, and we pray that the Most High imparts to them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But nonetheless, getting back to the point, and, and before I do that, let's go to, to John, the third chapter. Okay? And I don't know the reason why people are asking this. I know a lot of people try to get around the baptism, but... You know, there's, there's no way around it, right? Uh, this is St. John chapter 3, verse 5. Yeshia answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, or in verse 3, Yeshia answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yeshia answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So, number one, the Bible tells us that you must be born of water, that's the baptism, and through spirit. That's the renewal of the mind, okay? Verse 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you, shall be, you must be born again. The wind blow wherever it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Okay, so our spirit must be renewed, is what Christ is saying. And it's the Holy Spirit which helps that, that, that spiritual renewal, or, or is, is prominent in that process of spiritual renewal. So Christ said, the Spirit goeth wherever it listeth. So, if the Most High causes the Holy Spirit to fall upon someone before they're baptized, that's the will of the Most High. But that person being led by the Most High will afterwards go to the water and be baptized for the remission of sins. Okay? Now, there's a difference between what we see in the, for example, uh, someone being imparted with the gift of the Holy Spirit to continue on a mission or to, to, to uh, actually exercise a gift that the Most High have given them. For example, the Bible speaks about in the book of Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, uh, there's many gifts but the same Spirit. So when you speak about the imparting of the gift of the Holy Spirit through laying on of hands, we're talking about someone being actually, um, that, that Spirit now being given to propel the, the, the gifts that the Most High have given this person to exercise the gospel or to spread the gospel. Okay? That's different than a situation in which the, the Holy Spirit may come down for a moment and have someone speak uh, through tongues or speak in tongues in order to relay a message. Okay? Or at that time to bring forth a prophecy. Okay? Even though it's the same Spirit working in both of those instances, it's, there, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a difference. Okay? So the instances that we sometimes see of someone receiving the Holy Spirit before baptism may be them just speaking in tongues or prophesying just to show a manifestation of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But now you got the other aspect which someone is being laid on with hands in which this person is actually operating fully with the Holy Spirit, bringing forth 
their, you know, their gift in the gospel or exercising their gift in the gospel to bring people into the kingdom. Okay, that's, a, that's another lesson for another day. Okay, hopefully that answers your, your question. Um, let me see here. I'm going to try to go through these. I'm going to put it on pause at the moment and try to get through these as quick as possible. There's quite a few that are currently in the chat. What is the proper way to spell David in Hebrew? Uh, the proper way is the wad. Okay. The wad. Uh, we have truth seeking, which says, um, someone says they sent a few e emails, but haven't heard back. We'll make sure you receive a, um, we'll make sure you receive a, uh, response to your emails. Okay. Someone says, what is a good scripture that one can obtain strength from backsliding? Um, uh, Sirach or Ecclesiasticus in the Apocrypha, the second chapter. Okay, my son, when thou come to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. Okay, read that chapter. And that's a good one to um, gain strength uh, from, you know, from, from backsliding or keeping yourself from backsliding. Uh, John 3 and 13, and no man have ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man which is in heaven. Can you help us resolve this verse? Uh, can you help us resolve this verse resolving Enoch? Uh, absolutely. Let's go to the the context of what uh, was recorded in the book of John, the third chapter. Okay. So it says here in verse 11, John 3 and 11, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we, we do know and testify that which we have seen. And you receive not our witness. I told you earthly things and you believe not. How shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man have ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Okay? So what does Christ mean when he says that no man have ascended into heaven, but he which is descended? Some people look at, well, Enoch ascended into heaven. Okay? That's a contradiction. And the answer is, it's not a contradiction. All right? The reason is because, number one, though Enoch ascended into heaven, Enoch, number one, was not sent back to heaven after being translated. Okay? Once Enoch was translated into heaven, that was it. Okay? Secondly, when Enoch, or, or um, Enoch, wasn't sent down from heaven in order to perform this particular will that Christ was sent to perform. Okay? Christ came down, Christ ascended, uh, or Christ descended uh, into heaven, or, or descended from heaven, Salakia, in order to perform a particular will, which is to die for the sins of the nation of Israel. Okay? Also, to give the precept on this particular um, this particular verse, uh, Galatians 4. Or maybe Ephesians 4. I believe it's Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and 7 is the precept to explain this particular, uh, which may seem as a contradiction. Ephesians 4 and 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. So he bound captivity. Now Enoch didn't do this when he ascended, right? And gave gifts unto men. Now even though Enoch taught knowledge and understanding, he did not give gifts unto men during his ascension. Now he that ascended, what is it but also that he descended first into the lower parts of of the earth okay now we know in the book of Enoch it speaks about Enoch journeying 
in the, the places of Sheol and the lower parts of the earth, so on and so forth. But when Enoch went to the lower parts of the earth, he didn't take the keys of hell. Okay? He didn't gain control of hell. Right? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So, even though Enoch was translated into heaven, Enoch didn't fill all things with his ascension into heaven. It's the Son of Man that fulfilled everything that we're reading as it pertains to the one who ascended and descended. Okay, again, Enoch didn't lead captivity captive, meaning binding the spirit of captivity. He didn't give gifts to men. He didn't descend into the earth to take control over hell or to teach the gospel in hell. Okay. And Enoch, as great as he was, did not have power to release souls from that realm. Okay. And Enoch, again, as great as he was and as much knowledge as he gave us of this particular fight that we're part of, which actually is a part of what's taught in the gospel, Enoch did not fill all things. Christ did. All right. So that's the understanding when it says uh, no man have uh, ascended or descended, but the son of man. When you look at what goes into that ascension and descension, no man have accomplished that. What, what Christ accomplished. OK. Uh, when will the elders send us an email of the PDFs through the Pickerford Old Testament and New Testament? Also, there's no contact. It was given to for fellowship in the D.C. area. Uh, send an email to uh, gocc.south at yahoo.com for fellowship. Uh, for those PDFs, send an email to um, academychatquestions at gmail.com. Uh, we'll make sure you receive it, okay? Uh, Yashara. Um, Shalom, Elder. Our branch here requires us that we attend eight consecutive Sabbaths before one can be baptized. Although I am myself already baptized, my husband, sister, and brother-in-law are not. Hence, this is somewhat disheartening because all of us at least live two hours away from our closest church, making it unattainable to attend eight consecutive Sabbaths. As a result, they are unable to partake in events such as Passover and or communion. Uh, we are reserved for baptism for, or reserved for baptized members. Is there an alternative such as a class that can be taken to understand the baptism process, uh, what it means and what is expected of them um, as opposed to the prohibited uh, to be baptized due not to be being able to attend eight consecutive Sabbaths? Let me ask Sister Yashara, which uh, area are you located in? Which area are you located in, uh, Sister Yashara? Right, let me try to get through some more of these questions before we close out. Uh, when are we coming to Chicago? We actually went to Chicago last uh, February. Uh, we will be back in Chicago, the Lord wills, uh, very soon. You have to realize we have a lot of we have a lot of uh, areas to uh, we have a lot of areas to cover uh, before it's all said and done. So we're trying our best to you know fit as many places as possible in the schedule to make sure that we have an opportunity to uh, to visit as many places as possible but understand there's, there's a lot on the plate right now uh, someone says she's in the North Carolina area so I'll, I'll speak with the, um, the the elder in North Carolina and we'll, we'll work something out okay we'll work something out sister y y uh, Yashara all right So I'm putting the chat back on pause. Genghis Khan had a very large empire, so how do they figure in biblical history? 
it's just an extension of you know uh, the the histories that took place after the uh, the the time in which the Roman Empire uh, was really um, as the Bible says when the the, the womb was uh, or the uh, Salak and get a little scatterbrained here it's a little tired but nonetheless uh, when the the Bible says that the um, one of the heads of the dragon was wounded okay so during that period um, a few nations were able to, to come into power and gain great empires uh, during that time period such as Genghis Khan such as many of our forefathers who were able to gain great kingdoms and great empires during the time that Wall, uh, Rome was in a, a state of uh, um, uh, they were in a state of you know pretty much diminished from their their former power but we all know that eventually they regained that power okay uh, someone says uh, in the book of Jubilees it states that Abraham and Jacob celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles and Jubilees but I thought Tabernacles didn't come until Israel left Egypt is that a contradiction also Jubilees 1 are they putting reefs on their heads I thought there was a pagan uh, and Greek custom that's a very good question and to answer the first question first when it comes to uh, there being a contradiction between um, Jubilees and the Bible on the Feast of Tabernacles. What the Feast of, what the Book of Jubilees is showing is the history of a celebration which eventually became known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? Egypt wasn't the first time in which it was celebrated. It was first celebrated with Abraham and his children, and then eventually coming out of Egypt, it was instituted by Moses for the Israelites to follow. So for example, it's like when it comes to the circumcision. We know that the circumcision was established in Abraham. But later in the law, when we came out of Egypt, it now became also a, you know, a part of the law. Okay, being circumcised. Okay? So there's a lot of things which were in existence before Moses came on the scene. Many principles that were in existence before Moses came on the scene. But when Moses came on the scene, those things now became instituted, documented holy days that were to be followed and kept from generation to generation. Okay? Uh, also, Enoch 16 to 30. And that's, that's the thing also when it comes to dealing with uh, records, dealing with the different records. I've noticed just in this, this particular... Um, this Q&A segment alone, we've had quite a few questions uh, pertaining to the different records and how some things are perceived as contradictions. And that's why we, you know, we try to make sure that when brothers and sisters, when they go into the other records, they have a foundation in the Bible to be able to resolve information between rec from record to record. Okay? And then also, we have to realize that when one, when one book says one thing and another book says another thing, like for example concerning the Feast of Tabernacles, one being celebrated during the time of Abraham, another one being celebrated during the time of the Exodus, um, it's not necessarily because it's, you know, for example in the, the, the Bible it doesn't necessarily say that that's the first time the Tabernacles were celebrated. It's just showing us when that was instituted coming out of Egypt when it became an official holy day of the children of Israel. But the holiday itself was celebrated before Moses came on the scene. It was, it was celebrated by Abraham. Same, like, there's many things we can go into on that level. Uh, the tithing system. Yes, it became a law instituted in Moses, but it was first kept by Abraham. So what we have to do is, is we have to get that foundation in Scripture to be able to resolve some of these different queries when it comes to one book saying one thing and another book saying another thing. Okay? But nonetheless, let's, let's go to the, the second part of the question. Um, the book of Jubilee 16 and 21. And he built booths for, him, for himself and for his servants and, and this festival. And he was the first to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles on earth. Uh, let me get to the point about the reef. Verse 30. And to this there is no day, no limit of days 
for it is ordained forever regarding Israel that they should keep it, that they should celebrate <clears throat> Salakia and dwell in booths, and set wreaths upon their heads, and take leafy boughs and willows from the brook. And Abraham took branches of the palm and goodly fruit trees, and every day going around uh, the altar with branches seven times a day in the morning. And he praised the Most High and gave thanks uh, to the Most High for all things in joy. So the question is, is putting wreaths upon your head satanic based on what we, or is it, say, or I thought it was say, uh, a, a Gentile thing. Why is it being kept here? Okay. And we probably have to look into the, the actual custom of wreaths as it was kept uh, in accordance with what we read here. See if we can find the actual Hebrew to see if it's the same thing as a reef as we, we know it today. But nonetheless, as the, as the Bible states when it comes to certain things which people may perceive as, as being pagan, um, the pagans didn't create the branches or the, or the bows uh, that would be used. Let's say, for instance, it's actually talking about a reef as we know it. The pagans didn't create the, uh, the branches of the tree uh, which go into creating that reef. Okay? And I use that as an example going back to where Paul says in the book of Romans, or I believe it's Corinthians, where he says that um, for us who are believers, uh, or we know that there are, are God's many and Lord's many, but for us who are believers, there's only one God. Okay? So he used that as an example for those who would uh, look at meat that was sacrificed to idols and, and say, well, I can't touch that because it's been offered to an idol. Now, of course, you want to try to abstain from things which are offered to idols. You don't, you don't want to make that your first choice. But if you have to do so, you must realize that the pagans who sacrificed that beast did not create the, the cow that they offered a sacrifice. They didn't create the goat or sheep that they sacrificed. The Most High created the ox, the goat, and the sheep. Same way the Most High created the branches that are made to create a reef. Okay? So if that is the case, then, you know, on certain things, we have to look at it from that particular viewpoint. But again, it may take further research to see exactly what it was, what they were using uh, to create reefs, um, as it is mentioned in the Book of Jubilees. Okay? Uh, yes, there is a church in Philadelphia. There's a church in Philadelphia. Uh, why does the Bible sometimes speak in third person? Because you have to realize that when these records were written, they're writing from the perspective of secondhand accounts. Okay? Or sometimes even third pers person accounts. For example, uh, the books of Moses. Uh, some people look at it and say, well, if it's the books of Moses, why isn't it in first person? We have to realize that there came a time in which the original records of Moses were destroyed, as we're told in the book of 2nd Ezra 14, and eventually there had to be a rewriting or redocumentation of the laws of Moses. So when they were written in that time, it was written from the perspective of either second or, th or a third person, okay? Mainly third person, all right? So just to give the example of of the first five books, even though they're the books of Moses, they are a, a reconstitution of what was originally in those books of Moses, because Second Ezra 14 states that those original records that Moses received were destroyed. So the Spirit was put on Ezra to rewrite those records, but when they were written, they were, they were written from the third person, okay? And that's the, that's the same case for many other records in the Bible, okay? They're written from the perspective of the, the person who wrote them, who, of course, is, is being inspired uh, through the Holy Spirit to, to write them. How and where in the Bible did the nation of Edom turn white when Esau married into two black nations and was from black parents? That's a very good question. Number one, the Bible, going back to Esau's birth, in Genesis chapter 25, the Bible told, or the Most High told Rebekah, 
that two nations were in her womb. Okay, so the Most High made that separation between Esau and Jacob and the characteristics of Esau and Jacob. Verse 23 says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. So even though Rebekah was black, the Most High issued forth a command in which two nations which co would come forward from her womb. Okay? So I know a lot, a lot of people try to resolve it from, um, I guess you would say, and this is, this is no disrespect to you, but just because this is not the first time we've heard this question. We try to re resolve it from the, the low-level understanding that we receive concerning genetics and, you know, how races are developed and what the characteristics will be and what the, the complexion will be, so on and so forth. But that's not how the Most High dealt with this particular situation concerning Esau. He desired that two nations which co would come from the womb of Rebekah. Okay? So whatever it would take for those two nations to come forth from her womb and for those two nations to remain in the earth with those same exact characteristics, the Most High would make sure that that took place or takes place. Okay? So... In the Bible, again, it says, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. So it was meant for, for them to be two different nations with two different mannerisms. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So again, it was meant for there to be differences in attributes when it came to these children. It wasn't meant for Esau to come out looking like his father and mother, just because they were of a certain complexion. And the same thing would go for the generations of Esau. The Most High desired that those generations of Esau would remain as the generations of Esau when it comes to attributes, uh, when it comes to characteristics, when it comes to complexion. All right. We've seen and the reason why is because we've seen many instances throughout history where Esau seeks to hide himself among the nations. But time and time again, he can't hide himself amongst the nations. Why? Because the Most High have desired him to remain in the earth so that he can be identified. Okay? Now, on another level, we've also went into how it's possible that the Canaanite women who he married were of like complexion or, or were uh, suffering from leprosy. That could also be the case. Okay? But all in all, we know the Most High have sought to keep this nation operating in the earth until the last days, to where he can't hide amongst anyone. You'll be able to identify who Esau is. And it started from the day of his birth, when the Most High desired that from the womb of Rebekah, two nations would be born and separated with two different characteristics, mannerisms, complexions, so on and so forth. Okay? So we can't try to resolve it with just simply the, the whole complexion argument. His mother was this, that, and the third. The Most High sought, according to his will, to maintain Esau in the earth with everything that pertains to Esau. Okay? So, uh, moving here, moving on here, it says, uh, uh, What are the shooting stars that do not fall uh, to the earth? Uh, what are the shooting stars that do not fall to the earth. I'm assuming you're making reference to shooting stars that look like they're moving from one location to the next. Um, I would only be speculating to say what, what, what that is. Okay? I don't and I don't like speculation. Right? It says here, uh, Xenia Shalom Elder, what is the name of the author author of the NIV Bible? In most Christian churches that use that Bible, which I know is inaccurate. Um, I'm not sure who the author is of the NIV. I know there's different publishers of the NIV. But as, as far as the author of the NIV, I'm not sure. Let me see here. So it says here on Wikipedia, on the history of the NIV, it says, 
Uh, the NIV began in 1956 with the formation of a small committee to study the value of, of producing a translation in the common, common language of the American people. The project was formally started after a meeting in 1965 at Trinity Christian College in Palos Heights, Illinois, of the Christ Christian Reformed Church National Association of Evangelicals and a group of international scholars. The initial committee on the Bible translation consisted of E. Leslie Carlson, Edwin Clowney, Ralph Earl Jr., Burton L. Goddard, uh, R. Laird Harris, Earl S. Collin, Kenneth Cantzer, uh, uh, Robert H. Mounts, Charles F. Pfeiffer, Charles Caldwell Ryrie, Francis R. Steele, John H. Steck, J.C. Winger, Winger, uh, Stephen W. Payne, and Martin Woodstra. The New York Bible Society was selected to do, a, do the translation. The New Testament was released in 1973 and the full Bible in 1978. So I'm not sure if there's any particular authors of the translation. There are translators which were in, involved in the, um, the translation of the NIV. Okay, but however, you do have different publishers. You have like Zondervan, you have Nelson, uh, you have many different translators who are, or, or uh, publishers who are responsible for producing these translations. Okay, but there's, there's no particular author of the, the NIV. Uh, what is the difference between a church and a camp? Well, a church is what Christ established. Uh, as a gathering um, in the New Testament, okay? And it's an extension of what was already established uh, with our forefathers in the Old Testament with what we call the synagogue or what have you, okay? But basically a church, that word goes back to a uh, Greek word, ecclesia, which means gathering, okay? That's all a church is, a gathering. A camp is a uh, more so uh, a, a, a statement of uh, someone gathering or someone having some level of structure for the purpose of war. Okay, or in the instance of in the Book of Exodus when we came out of the land of Egypt, and in that case, the Most High referred to us as His host. Host is in reference to uh, someone who is mustered up for war the purpose of war, um, that term camp is in relation to um, someone who is mustered up or someone who is, uh, or, or, or a gathering or structure that is created for the purpose of war. Okay? Now, we, we tend to say that, listen, we're not a camp. We're a church. We're the gathering of Christ's church. We're not an Israelite camp. Okay? And we make that very clear. Christ, when he came didn't come to establish camps. He came to establish churches, gatherings. Okay, so I know a lot of people, they like to go into the whole military aspect thing of Israel. That's fine and dandy. If that's what you need to establish order, that's fine and dandy. But we are a church. Okay. All right, I'm going to answer a few more questions. All right, we're moving basically to the, uh, this is the, the what, the, the, th the three hour mark. So I want to just answer a few more and then we will uh, conclude. All right. Let me see what else I could find here. Um, I see in the, new, the news that the Arab Spring has finally come to Iran. How do you interpret these events according to prophecy? And uh, does this mean it's really close? Well, things are really close uh, concerning prophecy as it relates to the so-called Arab Spring popping up in Iran. Uh, what this means is that now we're going into that time that the Bible spoke of, of eventually a war being spawned which will cause Iran to eventually destroy both America and other Western world powers and also 
the land of Israel. So that's the time we're living in with them trying to move this thing over to Iran, which they've been trying to do for the longest. Okay. So it's just an extension of what we saw not only um, in the, the past few years with the Arab Spring, but there's been an attempt since the, the turn of the 19th and 20th century of trying to gain control and dominance over the Middle East, specifically for this time that we're talking about now. Okay, so we are very close. We're at the door of these prophecies being fulfilled. Okay. With that, I want to say bless you all and shalom. Um, if there's any more questions uh, that you may have that were not answered, uh, you can send an email to gathering as one, the word one at AOL.com. We have went back and started getting uh, through some of those those questions that you brothers and sisters have been asking. Um, secondly, uh, just to put it out there for those who would still like to join the academy, uh, we are still accepting enrollments. Uh, we are in our third week officially. This coming week we'll be dealing with the seed of promise, going into the history of the covenants, how they were established, how they relate to us today. All of that and more will be discussed in that lesson, uh, the seed of promise. Also, we have the news segment with Elder Ricard Shiar and Brother Shapat. It's a very great seg segment, spontaneous a lot of information on prophecy, such as what the person asked about the Arab Spring moving to Iran, as well as many other things leading to the, you know, the fall of America, the mark of the beast, so on and so forth. And then, of course, I deal with the, the Hebrew segment uh, of the academy, teaching foundational Hebrew, which will eventually help uh, develop your understanding, not of just the Hebrew language in general, but for the purpose of being able to actually go in and, and read uh, the, the Bible in Hebrew. Okay, so with that, I want to say thank you all for your support. Thank you all for tuning in. Until next time, bless you all and shalom.